Jesus. Jesus. Hey, God, we glorify you in this house this morning, God. We lift the name of Jesus in this house this morning, God. Come on, church. Come on, church. Hey, God. Hey, God. Oh, God. Hey, Karamashe. Jesus. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The Lord is looking for a people that will lift his son up. The Lord is looking for a people that will raise the name of Jesus. Because in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Hey, the name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we exalt you in this house this morning. Jesus, I ask you to glorify yourself through my life this morning, God. I ask you to get all the glory, God. Your, our agenda is your agenda this morning, Father. Jesus, have your way. Jesus, have your way. The word of God says when he be lifted up, he, God will draw all men unto himself. So we lift up the name of Jesus, God. Jesus, have your way. Jesus, have your way in this house this morning. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. Listen, sometimes it's okay to linger. Sometimes it's okay to linger. Because sometimes we get confused and we think, that a powerful message is just enough to break the chains. But the Bible says that the name of Jesus and the anointing Jesus is the only thing that you need to break every yoke of bondage in your life. So if we had to stand in this place and say the name of Jesus until everything broke, we would do it. We would do it. God, I elevate you in this house this morning. I thank you, God, for your name, Jesus, that you made it so simple, God, that in one name you can change all things. That in one name you can change all things, God. That it's not about a formula, that it's not about a program, but it's about a king with one name. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hey. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The name of Jesus is more powerful than every emotion that you have. And when the name of Jesus would be lifted up, you will be overwhelmed by righteousness, peace, and joy because that is the kingdom. And that is what the name of Jesus encompasses. Jesus, I thank you. You may be seated. Father God, I just ask you right now, God, that you would just light every word on fire, God, to penetrate the hearts, God. Not my words, but your words, God. I thank you for every soul in this house, every home and family and bloodline that they represent, God. And I just pray that today would be an everlasting change that would begin, God, that would continue through this series, Father. Yes, Lord. I pray, God, that one, not one person would leave unchanged this morning, God. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. God is good, y'all. God is good. I am so excited to be here. First thing I want to address is you guys have these. First of all, my name is Jess Davis. In case you don't know me, I'm usually behind the Welcome Center giving you a bunch of information you might not want, but it will come anyway. Um, but these awesome cards are uh, in your bulletins. These are for you to jot down some notes as you guys go throughout the series. Right now, if this is your first Sunday, we are in a series called It's Complicated. And it's uh, basically about emotions and how God views our emotions and how he has a plan and a purpose to set everything in line with his word. So I'm going to encourage you that as you go throughout the series, you guys would write this down. Write down whatever you want to write down on this. And I want to just thank and honor Pastor Craig and Miss Liz for giving me the opportunity, for allowing me the opportunity to come and preach to you, to y'all, to give you guys the word that I truly believe that God has put on my heart over the last several weeks. So I want to thank everybody for having me, putting up with me for the next however long this goes. I thank you all so much. <clears throat> so we're in a series called It's Complicated, and this week is titled where you look. And if you look at your card, just to recap a little bit, where did I just put it? To recap, the first week was who can you trust when it's complicated? What you think, 
where you look, and next week will be when it's complicated. So this morning, I'm going to be talking to you about where you look when your emotions feel complicated. How many of you find it hard when everything around you seems to be going crazy and chaotic to figure out where to put your eyes? How many of you find it hard to figure out what am I supposed to focus on when everything around me is chaotic? And let me just say that choosing to look at the right thing does not mean that you ignore the hard thing. And for a long time, I thought that choosing to look at the right thing meant that I had to avoid the chaos going on around me until I read a verse that says God uses all things for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So if you surrender every hard thing in your life, it will be used as a recipe for something good and something that will glorify God through your life. Amen? Amen. So choosing where to look is so much more than where you put your eyes. A few years ago, my family was in, as I've been preparing this, the Lord kept bringing me back to this kind of comical, disturbing story. So a few years ago, my family was in a lot of turmoil. Uh, we were physically broken and we were emotionally broken. And God was using this season to really reveal a lot of stuff that needed to be healed. But it started with some of our bodies breaking. So in May of that year, I uh, had come down, and when I say my family, I mean my personal immediate family, me, my mom, my dad, my brother, which they're all here, and I honor all of you. I'm so excited that you're here. God is so good. So, so in this season, starting in May of that year, I had had a terrible uh, infection of Lyme's disease that I didn't even know that I had, never found a tick. It was a very sick tick that bit me and made me very sick, and it was actually an infection that was traveling to my brain. I ended up in the hospital for six days. Uh, during that time, the Lord really sat me down to speak to me about some things that were sick inside of me at the same time. And so a few weeks later, after I got out of the hospital, I wasn't even driving yet because I had lost my hearing in this, my father gets into a terrible car accident, breaks his neck, nearly goes paralyzed, and just about every three to four weeks after this, every one of us had been hospitalized for one thing or another, and it was complete and total chaos. And there was this one day in the middle of all this that I just wanted to ignore reality. Have you been there? Where you are like, y'all, this has got to stop. I just want to look at something else. So one day, it was me and my children. I have three beautiful kids and my father, who at the time was in a neck brace with a broken neck and several broken ribs. And I said, Pop, get your shoes on. We're going away for a day. And we, we packed up our stuff and we went to what I was thinking in my mind because I'm avoiding reality, trying to force my eyes to physically look at something better than what was going on around me. I said, Pop, put your shoes on. Kids, put your shoes on. We're going for a hike. But it's not a scary hike, Dad. Don't worry. We're going to be fine. So, <laughs> so I'm sure he's dying right now. So... We get to this hike, I am oblivious to reality because I'm trying to ignore my circumstance, right? And look to the hills where my help comes from, right? So we go to the literal hills. And I said, all right, come on, everybody. Get your shoes, get your water bottle. And as we walk into this hike, my father is like this. And I look at his feet, and he's wearing open-toed sandals. Now... This hike is great because it's not like mountain climbing. It's all straight, so I thought this is going to be great, except it's kind of tailored toward children where there's huge tree stumps that you're supposed to frolic across and roots that are a good four to six inches high out of the ground. So here I am continuing to walk into the woods like, Dad, you'll be fine, come on, you'll be fine, come on. And he's looking up like, Jess, what are you doing to me, Jess? What are you doing? Open toe sandals. He's tripping. My kids are worried. My body, the type of Lyme disease that I had, destroyed my muscular system. So here I'm holding up my father, grabbing my kids, trying to keep them from going paralyzed. And I still didn't stop plowing through the woods with this man. So we finally get like a mile in. I'm like, Dad, I promise you at the end, there's a beautiful waterfall. We're going to love this. It's all going to be worth it because we're going to look at the beautiful waterfall, Pop. I promise you. And he's like, Jess, I'm going to kill you, Jess. When I get my neck back, I'm going to kill you, Jess. So we get into the woods. We get to the clearing. We sit down, and it's a blue sky. I swear to you on the ground I'm standing on, lightning bolt. Boom. 
We're a mile into the woods, standing near this beautiful picturesque scene, and it starts thundering and lightning. I'm like, Dad, we got to go quick. <laughs> Pop. <laughs> we got to go quick. So now he's like this, trying to get out of the woods, hopping over the things. And I realize when I get out of the woods how incredibly dangerous it is to plow when you're still broken. To plow when you're still broken. See, God doesn't want you to ignore the hard thing, to look at the right thing. A heavenly perspective is when you can look into your hard thing and see God. Amen. Not to ignore it, not to run away from it, not to plow through it, but a heavenly perspective, choosing to look up, is not removing yourself. It's saying, I'm willing to look into this and find you, God. I'm willing to look at this. So as I'm walking back to my car, God says to me, go home and find me. Go home and find me right where you are, Jess. That is what it means to look up. It means to be in and look from a heavenly perspective. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm really sorry, Pop, that we had to go through that for this great revelation. Who knew? Who knew, right? Okay. So, choosing to look up is seeing God in the middle of it all and trusting that his hand is at work in the chaos. Can we turn to Psalms chapter 3? We've been studying the life of David, the emotions of David, and if any of y'all have ever felt what my daughter calls emotionally constipated or emotionally chaotic, read about David because that is his life. Psalms 3, David ignores nothing. Let's read it. Psalms chapter 3. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him and God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and your blessing is on your people. David is ignoring nothing in his situation. He didn't go into the Psalms and say, the life is good, this is wonderful, you are a shield about me, the one that lifts my head. He says, I'm surrounded on every side. They're all talking about me, God. They're all saying that salvation cannot come from my soul, but you, my God, are a shield about me. You, my God, are the one who's going to lift my head. And I want to explain to you the illustration here of him saying God is the one that lifts his head. What he's saying is that all this stuff around me has had the power to press on me to the point where I couldn't even lift my eyes. Have you been there when the stuff going on in your life has had the power to press you down to the ground when it was hard? During that season, I remember sitting right over on that side one Sunday, and I came in and I sat, and someone came over to me and said to me, Jess, are you even able to stand? And I said, I can't, I can't even stand. The weight of it all was so heavy on me. The emotions that I was under was so heavy that I couldn't even stand between the physical breaking of my body and the physical breaking of my spirit and the breaking of my emotions. I was so pressed down to the ground that I couldn't stand. The actual definition of depression is the lowering of something or pressing something down. I believe this is also what David was descri uh, describing in Psalms 43.5, Pastor Craig referenced, which is when David said, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquiet disquieted within me? That word cast down in the uh, translation actually means to be collapsed. It means to be completely collapsed and brought down. Have you been there where the circumstances around you actually press on you, depress you? depress you. Let's not dramatize depression. We have all been there when it has literally pressed us, depressed us, pushed you down to the ground when it's too hard to even look up. About a week before um, Pastor Craig asked me to preach, I had had a vision. Um, and it's, I don't want to super spiritualize that. It's not like, you know, the room goes dark and everything, you know, you have this great like moment. 
I literally was just sitting there, and sometimes the Lord speaks to me in pictures because that's how I retain. And so I had this image of all of these people working hard, hardworking people in a field, but they were weighed down by these yokes and these burdens that they could not actually bring back the harvest because trying to get through with all of the weight that they were carrying was too much to actually get the job done. And I'm going to be totally honest, I didn't know if I was going to share this, but the next morning I woke up and my neck was so stiff, I couldn't look to the right, I couldn't look to the left, and I couldn't look up. And we had our women's link uh, that exact night. And um, uh, Miss Jen was sharing that night, and she said, I'm praying that the spirit of prophecy would be released in the church. And for a split second, I thought, well, maybe I'm feeling this. I don't know. And I went to the chiropractor. I did everything, and I said, God, am I feeling what they're feeling? And I prayed over my neck, and I woke up, and it was gone. And I began to pray, God, break the yoke. Break the yoke off their necks. Break the yoke off their necks. I want to illustrate this. Can I get Aaron? Where's my amazing husband? I'm so glad he's here because I usually preach to women. And unless I put him in like a dress, which would not be acceptable, (laughs) uh, I don't get to have my amazing husband, my priest. I honor him. I would not be here. I would not be who I am if it wasn't for him. And I want to illustrate this. Thank you, honey. And he built this. Come on, y'all. I want to illustrate this. So... This is an actual yoke. This is what people are using when they cannot afford machinery, right? So this is a single laborer yoke. And in my vision, this is what I saw. And I did not know that this was a thing. I didn't know this would look like. I had to look it up. So I saw this, and what the Lord showed me was that people, because they have not learned how to surrender, they have not learned how to process well, how to see me in their circumstances, they're collecting all the wounds and all the worries and all the cares and all the circumstances, and it's filling these buckets, and they're trying to work with me, work for me, but they're weighed down. They're weighed down by their yoke. And when the Word of God refers to a yoke in a negative sense, It means to be enslaved to. And the word burden in the word of God literally means an overbearing load. So this illustration shows you what it looks like to be enslaved to your burden. So when you do not know how to process your emotions well, or process your chaos well, or process your circumstances well, you will collect them. And if you try to ignore them, they will not leave. You will collect them and you will carry them. And your emotions will flow through the condition of these buckets. Your emotions will flow through what you have collected in your buckets. This is what it means to be yoked. I know that when in the Word of God it talks about uh, yokes of bondage, but you can also be burdened with a yoke. Your yoke can be your burdens that you are not meant to carry. Your neck was not created for this weight, y'all. This morning, the Lord wants, to remi- wants me to remind you that Jesus came to break this up off your neck and take it upon himself. He came with an anointing to break every yoke of bondage. Yoke of bondage just means something you're enslaved to. So if you're enslaved to anxiety, if you are ex- enslaved to worry, and you can live in a family that's had a bloodline that says, if you're in this family, you're just anxious because we have an anxious family. Jesus came with an anointing that breaks that, and he flows righteousness, peace, and joy through your life, through your bloodline. You do not have to be yoked to anything that is not of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Jesus came for this. I was thinking of it when Pastor Tim was talking. Luke 4, 18 and 19. I'm going to go over this real quick because I want to go to other places. Luke 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit, this is Jesus talking about himself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, which means good news. I have good news. This is not what you are meant to look like. Preach good news to the poor. This word poor means spiritually poor or destitute or one who crouches or cowers. So 
That's what spiritually poor means. Pastor Tim was talking about being poor, and all I thought about was this. Because when you got this filled with your junk, it cannot be filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. There has to be a trade-off. He came to break all of that to fill them with something else. And he will carry the stuff that was once in your bucket. Amen? He says, so I have come to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor, spiritually poor, destitute, one who crouches or cowers, the one who does not feel like they can stand upright. He's saying, I came for you. I didn't just come for the drug addict. I didn't just come for the rapist. I didn't come, just come for those that are in those really bad situations. I came for you if you can't stand up straight. I came for you if you crouch or if you cower. Jesus has sent me, or he says he has sent me to proclaim release Pardon or dismissal to the captives. When you don't know how to process these and you carry them around, you are captive to it. He says, I've come to break everything that holds you down, everything that holds you captive, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. The word oppressed, I used to think it meant pressed hard. It's not what it means. Oppressed means broken into pieces, shattered, smite, or bruised. He's saying, I have come with an anointing to take this up off your neck and hold you, make you be able to stand upright. And it's good news, right? It's good news. Amen. Jesus is actually, here's the thing, sometimes we're ashamed. What if it's shame in my buckets? Jesus is attracted to your yoke because he came to break it. This says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to come and take everything that makes you crouch or cower. This is not something to be ashamed about. If you come in church and you stop at the door and you try to pretty yourself up, God says, I am attracted to the thing that you're carrying because I want to take it from you. Don't try to dress it up at the door. Come in exactly the way you are, and I have come to take it from you. Amen, that's good news. That is good news. But here's the thing. Jesus wants to replace it because, again, this is a single labor Yoke, what does the word of God say? We are co-laborers with Christ. So you are meant to trade this for a different kind of yoke. You are not ever meant to labor alone. Amen? Amen. Turn to Matthew eleven twenty-eight and 29. What is the yoke of Christ? Matthew eleven twenty-eight and 29 says, Come to me. This is exactly like my vision. Come to me, all who are weary, which means toiling, and burdened. I'm going to put this back on again. Here we go. I said to my kids last night, should I put rocks? They're like, no, Mom, we don't want you to break your neck. Okay. So it says, come to me, all you who are weary, which means toiling. It doesn't mean tired. It means those who are toiling, spinning in my seat, and I'm not getting anywhere, running on a treadmill, and I feel like I'm not pulling in what you've called me to pull in, God. Come to me, all who you are weary and toiling and burdened, which means overloaded. I just feel overloaded, man. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. I want to give you the picture that Jesus is painting here. <clears throat> so, there are a few places in Scripture where God refers to Christians as oxen. But I would like to tell you, God is allowed to do this. Husbands are not allowed to do this. Um, my husband wants to write a book one day called The Things I Learned Early in Marriage That You Don't Say to Your Wife. <clears throat> so, so I just want to use this. So ox is just a cow that's had some special stuff done to it. So, um, so I was pregnant with my daughter. Just a funny story here. Um, I was pregnant with my daughter, my first child. And, and if anybody knows us, my family is from New York City, from Queens, Brooklyn. And my husband's family is from lots of cattle farm myths, um, from Pennsylvania, growing up on farms. And so merging these two cultures has been fun these last 18 years. <clears throat> and so... Um, so I was very pregnant with my daughter, and I said to my husband, babe, and if anyone knows Aaron, I'm like super all over the place, and Aaron's always steady, <clears throat> and we, so we balance each other well. Um, and I said, babe, you don't look nervous at all. Like, we're having a child. Do you understand? Like, 
you don't look nervous. And he's like, I swear to you, so innocent, so innocent. He says, I've delivered cows. <laughs> now I'm very pregnant and a little emotional. And I'm like, did you just compare me to a cow? I can't believe you just compared me to a cow. And of course, he learned as soon as the words came out. You ever have like those, oh no, oh no, come back, come back. <clears throat> so God is allowed to compare us to goats and donkeys and oxen. Do not do that with your wife or your husband because, <clears throat> you know, it can go both ways. So this is, <laughs> this is what Jesus is saying in this uh, in this. What he's saying here, he's saying, take my yoke upon you, come to me all you who are toiling and overloaded and I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you. So let me explain what this means. When a young ox is being brought into a field to learn how to labor, it is double yoked with a larger, stronger ox. And the purpose of this yoking from the younger one to the older, wiser, mature, built, strong one is so that the small one can learn exactly how to be like and handle the load like the big one. That is the illustration that Jesus is giving. There's a few things that this yoke does for the smaller ox. First of all, the farmer knows when he's going to yoke the two, I'm not going to put the load on the little one. I'm going to put the load on the big one so that the little one can focus on how to be like the big one. And what this yoke does, let me go through a few of this. I want to read this so I don't miss any of it. The farmer puts the weight or the load on the large ox so that the younger can focus on learning how to be like the larger ox instead of pulling the load. These are a few things that this double training yoke does. One, it keeps the smaller ox close to the larger ox to teach him how to stay on course and to protect him. The young ox learns to push past where he thought he could go. He learns the appropriate time to rest and the appropriate time to move because the young ox is not as smart as the big ox. So he's going to be all impulsive and try to buck and go and do, and then he's going to pass out midway and not be able to bring back what he went out to get. So the big ox says, now it's time to stop because I want you to bring back everything we planned. So now it's time to stop. He says, when the little one thinks I can't go anymore, my muscles aren't that big, I don't know how to do it, the big one says, no, you're connected to me, and now it's time to walk. Now it's time to walk. Okay, he learns to listen to commands. So when the farmer speaks to the big ox, the big ox listens. I want you to think of you and Jesus. When the farmer speaks to the big ox, he listens. The little ox don't know how to hear yet. So the little ox, ox has to be yoked to the big one to learn how to hear the farmer, to learn how to hear the one that's putting the orders into play. He needs to learn how to take commands well and quickly and on time, right? Here's what happens. The little ox doesn't always know that it can trust the big one. So sometimes it panics or it rebels thinking it knows better. And what happens with the yoke? It shifts the weight and puts it on the small ox. The yoke shifts when the little ox pulls or spins or toils in a panic and the weight shifts. And let me explain something. The big ox never disciplines. He remains steady all the time. Picture this. Picture yourself next to the big ox, right? The big ox knows what it's doing. It knows where it's going. The little one doesn't. All the little one has to do is stay close to the big one. But what if a snake comes that the big one's able to crush? What if the storm comes that the big one knows how to take shelter? What if that happens and the little one doesn't understand? So the little one goes in a panic, pulls, the yoke drops, and now it feels crushed by the weight. But the big one says, I'm going to stay right here. You come right back into alignment and it'll shift the yoke. Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, on you and learn from me. As I've been preparing for this, I hear the Lord saying, tell them, no, don't panic. 
Don't panic. The big one's got it under control. Don't panic. I cannot even begin to tell you how many times panic has caused me to pull from the big ox and shift the weight onto me, and I felt crushed by the weight. There was this one time a few years, actually several years ago, my, my uh, middle child, Kyle, he, uh, he has, went through a really long diagnosing period. He was sick a lot, and he has a really rare uh, immune deficiency called an NK cell deficiency. And with this deficiency, um, the NK cell is your first line of defense against cancer. And so after about a year and a half, two years actually, of a diagnosing process, this came back completely deficient and inactive, and at the same time, they found an irregular mole that had to be surgically removed and biopsied for cancer. Yo, I was like, this is not okay. And I immediately went into a panic. And, and now, when I, now that I have this image and this illustration in my mind, I see myself spinning. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I wanted to go to the doctor and get whatever they could give me to help me until God. I heard the invitation, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. And then now I can see myself coming right back into that big ox and the weight reshifting. He just knows how to wiggle that thing right back on. Get it off you. Get it on him. Let's go. It's not punishment. He remains steady. He remains steady, right? Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He says, you need to be yoked to me because I am the kingdom of God. There is a constant flow of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit when you are yoked to Christ. So if you pull from that, you are going to feel anxiety, fear, and chaos. That's what the weight is going to do. But when you realign yourself, when you allow that yoke to realign, you will feel righteousness, peace, and joy no matter what's going on around you. The Bible says that the kingdom cannot be shaken. So Jesus is saying, I don't want you to go through pain. This is not a slavery yoke. This is a co-labor yoke, but I'm going to do all the work. I'm going to carry the load. I just need you to come and be co-labor with me, walk with me, learn from me, and no matter what goes on around you, I can't be shaken. I can't be shaken, amen? amen? Jesus is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy labored, and I will give you rest. I will protect you in my shadow. Do you know you can't be protected in a shadow if you're not close to the thing that's casting it? So when you're feeling exposed to the elements... It's because somewhere along the line you panicked and you walked away from the thing that cast the shadow. You've walked away from the bigger ox. All this service I want you to hear, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Give me your buckets and I will give you rest. Amen? Amen. Don't panic. I want to give you three ways to stay yoked and keep a heavenly perspective. Number one, be willing to shift your perspective. So I always thought perspective was all visual. Like, okay, I'm going to look at the piano from here, and I see what I see, but now I'm going to move over here, and I'm going to look at it from over here and see how it looks different. That's not what perspective is. The definition of perspective is a particular attitude towards. The word perspective means your attitude, the condition of your heart, is what your perspective flows through. So if your heart has been tainted, you're not going to see the right thing. So when you hear someone say, shift your perspective, it's actually saying, what is the condition and the attitude of your heart when you look at a thing? What is your heart like when you look at at a thing, this is why David prayed, search me and know me and see if there is any unclean thing in me because he knew if my heart is dark, I'm going to see darkness. If I cannot find God, if he is not allowed to penetrate every part of my heart, then I will not see him in my circumstance. Shift your perspective. If you're looking into your situation and you can't see God, what is your heart feeling? What is the condition of your heart? What is the condition of your heart? Would you see your circumstance differently, even toward God, if you changed your attitude? That's kind of sharp. 
But if we want to see something change, we got to be willing to change something on the inside. Yeah. Right? When my brother died sev suddenly uh, several, uh, how many years, eight years ago, um, I was so angry. God, can I get real in church? Can I get real for a minute? This was my lifelong prayer was for my brother. And he died suddenly. It was a robbery, man. It felt like I was robbed. And I was angry at God. God, you didn't hear me. God, you lied. God, where did you go? God, you turned your eyes. And God said, change your heart and you will find me. Woo. Jess, change your heart. Shift the condition of your heart. Be willing to change what you think you know. And be willing to find me even where you think I've hurt you because it doesn't intimidate God when you don't understand. Proverbs 3, 5 says, do not lean on your own understanding. He's promising you, you're not going to understand, but I can give you a peace in what you don't understand. Amen. He's not intimidated by your anger at him. He's not intimidated by your misunderstanding of him. He says, come to me if you're carrying that, and I will give you rest and a peace that surpasses your understanding. You don't have to understand. Right? When I was willing to shift my attitude, I could see God. I could see him. I could see his love and his grace and his mercy. When we allow our hearts to get dark and bitter, it's hard to see God in our situation. But when we remain close to the bigger ox and trust that he is bearing it all, he promises to use it all for, his, for our good and his glory. And he, can, uh, he promises, even if you're feeling like you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, when you are willing to find God in it, when you're willing to soften your heart toward God, even with what you don't understand, you will see that he's walking you through the valley of the shadow of death. Amen. It doesn't say he popped him out, he snapped his fingers, he said, though you walk me through it. Through it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the earthly things, for you have died and your life is hidden in Christ. This is not saying ignore what's happening on the ground. It's saying as we are co-laboring on the ground, yoke your heart to mine and you'll see it the way I see it. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying don't ignore it. As we walk together through this very difficult thing we call life, this very complicated thing we call life, he says, if your heart is knit with mine, you will see my perspective. You will have a heavenly attitude like Christ did. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. There's no way unless he was yoked to righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God. Right? When you remain yoked to Christ, you remain yoked to righteousness, peace, and joy. And you cannot be yoked with both. Right? Amen. Amen. Shifting your perspective does not mean life will be easy or that you won't feel pressure. A yoke is still a yoke. The difference is you don't got the buckets. But you're still going to feel something because God is creating you into the image of his son. So think about pressure. Pressure can depress and flatten or it can produce and shape. Think about a potter in the clay. It takes pressure to shape and produce perspective turns, depressing pressure into productive pressure. Perspective turns what depressed you into something that produces you. Your circumstance might not change, but you're being formed instead of being flattened. Amen? Amen. Man, God allows things of pressure. Listen, you have to get perspective. I'm not going to come up here and preach that when you have a good perspective, you're going to walk out of here and sing, you know, this is the day the Lord has made and do backflips on your way to the car. God allows things of pressure to expose and reveal what needs to be pressed out of you without crushing you without crushing you, because here's the deal. When you got junk in there that has to be pressed out, it will be filled with anointing when it's gone, so then the pressing will expose and reveal the character of God through your life. But you have to allow a pressing of the things of the earth. You have to allow things to be pressed out so that he can fill it and ooze out. Because these buckets will be replaced with anointing. 
that everything that had the power to crush you, that had the power to press you, that had the power to depress you, will be something used to hold anointing to set someone else free. Come on. That's exciting. I get excited. Y'all don't have to be excited. I get excited. Woo. Amen. Pressure is productive with the right perspective. With the right attitude, pressure is productive. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 10 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, which means confused, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, crushed down, but not destroyed. What he's saying here is with the right perspective, when all those things that should have crushed you, that should have depressed you, that should have frustrated you, that should have confused you, I promise you with the right perspective, they're going to expose glory through you. It actually says that the power of God is released when you have enough pressure that's supposed to crush you and it doesn't. Power is released. So this is not a wonderful message of there will be no pressure. This is a message of no matter what you face in life, he promises to show power through your life. To show power through your life. Pressure is productive. This actually describes the way a diamond is formed. It says treasure in jars of clay. Clay is like the earth. Diamonds are created in the earth. Do you know that scientists can't even figure out how much heat and pressure is required to make a diamond because they can't go deep enough to find out? So in the depths of who you are, where you feel like you've been buried and crushed and under intense pressure, this verse is saying, through all that pressure and through all that crushing and through all that persecution, I'm creating a diamond on the middle of you. And when the time is right, do you know that diamonds only come out of the earth? Wait. Diamonds only come out of the earth through volcanic eruption. The only way that a diamond can get high enough to be retained is through volcanic shaking. So this verse is saying, those things that you think should be destroying you are creating a diamond in you, and at the right time, I'm going to bring a shaking, and it's going to bring a diamond out of you. And that diamond is going to be like a prism. Do you know what a prism does? It breaks up the colors. And a diamond does the same kind of thing. It's going to reveal the character of Christ through every single difficult thing in your life. When God says, now the time has come, all that stuff that had the power to weigh you down, I'm filling it with anointing. I'm going to pull it out and reflect every part of my character off of everything that tried to hurt you. Come on. Come on. Oh. Come on. The pressure of Christ's yoke refines the treasure in you and reveals Christ through you. If you're under pressure, don't panic, surrender, because a treasure is being made. Christ is in you, but you've got to be refined to be one with him. The pressure is refining, not depressing. Amen. <clears throat> Number two, declare your victory. After you shift your perspective, you've got to declare it. After you shift your perspective, you have to declare it. David ended Psalms 3 with declaration, with the declaration, salvation belongs to the Lord and your blessing is upon your people. He started that psalm with the reality of his difficult situation, went into a perspective shift and ended with a declaration. I'm telling you, powerful things happen when we declare what God says into what we see and into how we feel. Power happens. Faith is activated when you speak what you know to be true in your spirit into what doesn't look right. That is when power and faith is activated in your life. I know it's hard. Sometimes you just want to watch Netflix till the cows come home or the oxen come home and eat ice cream out of a container. But that's not what we're called to do. If you want the yoke to be shifted back onto him and off y'all, you got to start declaring because that breaks it. That shifts it. I may feel like I'm falling apart, but I declare that I know I'm safely kept in my father's arms. I may feel like I'm surrounded, but I know there's a heavenly host fighting on my behalf. I may feel like I'm dying on the inside, but God, I declare that I'm being renewed daily. I may feel like I'm stuck in the valley of the shadow.
shadow of death, but I declare that you're walking me out. God, I feel like this battle over here has the power to take me out, and I just don't feel like I'm winning, but God says I'm an overcomer in Jesus' name. When you begin to declare this, it shifts the oak. <laughs> Declaring is hard when we don't feel it, but it's the thing that shifts the perspective. You can sit where you are, but you're being buried. Or you can start activating your faith and speaking what you know into what you see, and then this weight will change. Amen? Amen. <sighs> okay, last one. Number three. Daily cast your cares on the Lord. Pastor Craig, I loved that last week he uh, ended with this. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Confirmation. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Listen, you are desperate for Jesus every day of your life because people, the enemy, your emotions, your self, circumstances will fill these every day. Every single day you are desperate for Jesus. If Jesus was desperate for God and drew away to pray, you are desperate for Jesus. You are desperate for Jesus every single day because the cares and the anxieties and the chaos and the fear and people and whoever are going to try to fill these buckets. Every day we need to cast. That's why in Philippians 4, 6, Paul says, be anxious for nothing but, oh wait, let me just say this, cares uncast turn into anxieties. Cares uncast, collected care is what will become your anxiety. It is not holy to walk around and not feel the need to let it all go. I don't like to cry. I hate to grieve, and I don't like to process, and here I am, preaching on grieving and processing well. But I learned if I carry, these things will become my anxiety, and it's actually the strength of my spirit that knows that it needs Jesus. Right? Not when you think you don't. So that's why Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your requests or cares known to God. It says if you don't make your cares known to God, you will operate in anxiety. But be anxious for nothing and cast your cares, and the peace of God that surpasses your understanding will guard your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus. Cast your cares daily. Can the worship team uh, just come on up? See, Jesus cares about everything in your buckets, and he wants to take it and connect you to peace that surpasses your understanding. This is a process. Let me explain. Sometimes when you don't realize this for a long time, like I was a, I was, I know I'm an adult, but I was older than I would have liked to be, when I had this revelation. So sometimes you realize that the stuff you're carrying in your buckets has been there since you were a little boy or girl. And it's a process to allow God to come and search your bucket. Because you've been carrying this stuff for a long time and I don't want to give you the misconception that this is an easy bing, bang, boom thing. This is a daily process of saying, God, I feel it again. God, I feel it again. And that's why he says, come to me, all you, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That invitation is there for you every day. Not just when you backslide, not just when, blah, 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 whatever excuse you want. Every day, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Maybe the things in your buckets are from when you were little and you've never let them go. And without surrendering and allowing Christ to go through your bucket, declaring won't be enough, shifting your perspective won't be enough. There has to be an act of trading. So for years and years and years, I was tormented with fear. Tormented with fear. And, and I, I mean, this was into me preaching. And I still had this fear that would cripple me in the middle of the night. I would have these, in, I, would, I would imagine terrible things happening and me being vulnerable and alone when I was surrounded by people. And so I finally got so sick and tired of it. I, I started to go on this quest of God, 
why do I have this fear? If I declare and I quote scripture and I do all this stuff right, why do I have this fear? And so at this time, my dad was in the hospital and I went over to visit him and I, I began to vent to him and I said, Pop, you got to help me. I got this fear. I don't know what to do. And he says to me, Jess, perfect love casts out all fear. So if you don't have fear or if you have fear, it's because you don't believe God loves you. And I said, no, 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 I do. I don't like that answer. So, <laughs> so I went to my husband and I said, babe, I'm so sick and tired of this torment of fear. I don't want to be afraid anymore. And, my, and I didn't tell my husband what my dad said. And my husband says, perfect love casts out all fear. You must not believe that God loves you. And I said, shut up. I don't like that answer. I do believe God loves me. And so I, I, that night, that very, this all happened in one day. And that night, I'm scrolling through the TV. Aaron fell on the, asleep on the couch. And Andy Stanley comes on, or Charles Stanley, whoever the father is. Who's the father? Charles. Charles Stanley comes on the TV, and I was like, all right, let's get some positive, you know. And what is it on? Perfect love casts out all fear. If you have fear, it's because you do not receive perfect love. You don't believe God loves you. And I took the remote, and I threw it. I was so frustrated. And I finally got on my knees, and I said, God, why do I have fear? I believe that you love me. I believe that you care for me. Why do I have fear? And God brought me back to some very young, vulnerable moments where there were times, and you've all been here because we are all in relationship with imperfect humans, where you believe they love you, but they don't have the infinite power to protect you. And so from a little girl, I had a misconception of the love and protection of God. And God said, I need to begin to unpack your bucket because this is not a bing, bang, boom, slap some Advil on it and your headache's gone. This is something I carried for a long time. And so I went on a quest. I began to fast and I began to pray every day, not out of works, but out of God. I'm excited for the hunger because I know that I'm going to find you in this hunger. I don't want this fear anymore. I believe you love me, but I did not equate love with trust and protection. We translate our human situations onto our heavenly father. And he says, you've put that in your bucket and your emotions are flowing through the condition of your experiences and your heart. And you got to start to unpack the bucket so you can declare and you can change your attitude all you want. But if you don't bring your buckets and dump them at the feet of Jesus, it's not going to change. It's going to be like an Advil in the middle and the minute it wears off, you're going to be back crippled again. Can everybody stand? God is not shocked or disappointed with what you have in your buckets. He's inviting you to bring it all. Jesus wants to begin to go through what you've been carrying with you and unpack what's been weighing you down. Today is a start, but I want to put a plug in real quick, not because the, uh, my parents are super cute and they run Celebrate Recovery, but that's an amazing ministry where... It's not just about uh, recovery from addiction. That is a ministry that's completely set aside for people who have weighty buckets. Amen. And these people have the grace and the love and the experience to sit with you and unpack one thing at a that's time. Right. Every week, let's see, how I did it. I went and I would go into those meetings every single week and I'd say, you know what y'all, I'm not okay but I'm determined to get up out of here okay. I didn't have addiction. I didn't have that, but I had stuff in my buckets that I was sick and tired. Are you tired of trying to bring back the harvest with 1,000 pounds on your back? Can the prayer team come up? The Bible says that the comfort you have received, you will use to comfort others. Here's what happens. The Lord will turn your wounds and your worries into weapons to slay the enemy in your life and the life of those around you. I have no aspirations to be a great preacher at all. I literally have this envisioned in my mind that every wound, 
every worry, every problem I've ever been through has been turned into a weapon that I am responsible to destroy the lie of the enemy in my life and the lives of those around me, to advance the kingdom of God. Because this is so much bigger than just you. This vision was about people trying to work in the field. The Bible says you are labored. The, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. What if it's not that the laborers are few because we don't got people saved, but it's because they can't walk, because they're so burdened. The enemy has them so deceived that you got to carry your own junk. And Jesus is saying, when you come to me, you're going to reap the harvest. So everybody, uh, can every, everybody close their eyes and bow their heads amazing time with these amazing people, Father God. And I just pray that right now you would begin to work on the hearts and you would begin to draw them up, Father God. Those that have been burdened and waited because Jesus knows that the Bible says that he's making intercession for you. So Father God, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to just draw your children up to freedom this morning, God. I pray that there would be a gentle tug on the hearts, Father God. I come against all shame right now and condemnation right now for what they may have been carrying for decades, God. I come against all condemnation right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father.